Thank you, gentlemen. Hi. McCormick had prevented us from shooting the meeting. We caught him outside and asked if he learned anything. I learned what their lives are like because of what has happened to them. So John was only now considering how the other half lived. As for his pals, the class of 1960, 11 of them would turn out to be abusers or enablers. Probably the most familiar among them was Paul Shanley, a serial abuser who addressed the initial gathering of NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association. McCormick covered for Shanley, and Birmingham, and other alumni and colleagues. In 1985, John McCormick, Joe Birmingham, and three other priests from their class took a trip to Europe together in celebration of their 25th anniversary in the priesthood. This was some 10 years before he told my brother he knew nothing about Birmingham between the time he left Salem and the time he died, and that they certainly weren't close. Two years after this European vacation, a parent of an altar boy from St. Anne's in Gloucester, who had heard rumors of Birmingham's previous misconduct, contacted McCormick about his concerns. McCormick told the parent that he spoke to Birmingham and that, quote, he has assured me there is no factual basis to your concern. From my knowledge of Father Birmingham and my relationship with him, I feel he would tell me the truth, and I believe he is speaking the truth in this matter. My work with John McCormick is over. He has no moral authority left. He's so clearly discredited by just the evidence that's sitting in his file. Paul was done with McCormick, but I had to give him another chance. I was on the road when we finally connected. So the reason I called you, this whole process for my brother has sort of become a process for me too. And uh, Paul went and got therapy for this, and my therapy is that I've been working my way through it by making a film about it. And uh, it's a film about a family and, and how we're all trying to find our way through whatever this religion was to all of us. I don't know if, if you would be interested in being part of it, because you are part of it. Uh, you're a big part of it, and a lot of people talk about you, and, and frankly, it's not very complimentary. And I'm just offering you the opportunity, because I don't want to go through this process and make a film, and then at the end, someone say, well, you know, it seems so one-sided, why don't we hear anything from... Uh, from John McCormick. Why, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you be believed? I don't understand that. I am giving you this opportunity and you're denying it. I mean, I think what my brother's doing by doing this film is a lot harder than what you'd have to go through. I want you to know that I did ask you to do this and that when this thing comes out and there's negative things about John McCormick in it, that you understand why they are not countered. Every once in a while, there's a little kid in me that says, he shouldn't be bishop. And then I kind of stand back and say, yeah, but it's just a big joke anyway. What does it mean? What does the post of bishop in the Catholic Church really mean? The organization has just been around a long time. It's built this incredible power, and it's holding on to that power. It is more concerned with maintaining that power than it is in actually carrying out the mission that it says that it's all about. It's not the religion, and it's not all the priests, and it's not all the people who go to church. It's the guys at the top. It's the guys that protect the Birminghams and the Gagans and all of these priests. The cardinals that promote the McCormicks. Being the bishop basically means there's a good chance you probably are a rotten guy that, that has just climbed to the top of that corporate ladder. They're just a bunch of corrupt businessmen, and they are sitting on top of the evil empire. I can read the Bible, I can read the Gospels, and draw my own conclusions, and maybe I ought to get together with some friends and sit down and talk about Christianity and figure out how to lead my life, but I'm not going to take it from you, just because you're dressed in black and you've got a collar on. Back at the house, the family holds tight to old habits. Downstairs, my Aunt Kay, 99 years. Body and blood of Christ. Be brought together in unity. By Upstairs, my parents, still attending church. They still have their church, St. Mary's Italian, built by neighborhood hands, funded by neighborhood money, 
it is a refuge, free of scandal. It, it was a comfort after we found out what happened to Paul, that we had our own church. We found comfort in our own church. But for good Catholics like my parents, even that comfort would soon be taken away. I have a copy of the letter from the apostolic administrator of the Archdiocese of Boston, the Most Reverend Richard G. Lennon. After a thorough study of the situation of St. Mary Italian Parish in the city of Salem, and having consulted the current administrator and parishioners of St. Mary's Italian Parish, a recommendation was made by the Most Reverend Francis X. Irwin that St. Mary Italian Parish will be suppressed. Every time I come in this church, I look and I can see everything that everybody did, all the names of all the people. I see my father's painting up there, and it made him live in that. The goods and obligations of St. Mary Italian Parish become the goods and obligations of the Archdiocese of Boston. We gave these gifts to God. They are taking it. They're stealing the gifts. And to have this church being taken from us is a sin. It's a big sin. When I hear that they're going to close the church, part of me says, big deal. But when I look at the reality of what closing this particular church means to this particular community, it's just one more screwing that somebody's getting from the hierarchy. Here are my parents trying to deal with what happened to their son, and at the same time, the organization that did this to their son is ripping the one thing that's the most important thing in their life out of their lives. Their kid was abused, and now they're getting abused. Clearly, there's a connection between the millions of dollars that are going to be bled out of the Archdiocese of Boston to settle these cases and the fact that they're closing down churches like this that are debt-free and sitting on valuable pieces of real estate. January 2003, the last Mass. A bishop steers me down. A priest tries to get me to stop, to throw me out. But he can't tell me or us to leave. It's not his to take. It's ours, our culture, our names below the statues, embedded in the stained glass. I stand my ground, start to feel the power shift. It makes him very sad. And this local bishop, the one who closed it? Francis Irwin, one more member of the church's power elite that came out of that class of 1960. Two parishioners are supposed to give speeches, tributes to the history of Salem Italian Catholicism. Irwin decides against it, abruptly ends the ceremony before any unanointed local voice can be heard. Dad can't let this one pass. Thank you. What happened to the last two speeches? Bishop Oh, come on. He says, the bishop didn't like the idea. I says, who the hell is the bishop? Hey, 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 hey. Oh, no, I mean it. I mean it. This is our church. We had a right to have one of our people speak. Please. No, please. No, please. Then I apologize. I don't know why. I don't know what the hell made me apologize in a minute, in a sense. Now that I think of it, the more I think of it, I don't know why. Well, that's my bringing up in the church, that's what it is.